commitment to the Arctic, our uh, commitment to exercise our responsibility for the well-being of the Arctic land and people, and the importance of those peoples of the North, the traditional knowledge and lifestyles that Stephenson benefited from so much that he promoted through the idea of the friendly Arctic, and how that is very much a part today of the Canadian government's uh, focus on development for the people of the North through our, our northern strategy, our Arctic foreign policy, and our chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Uh, so it, it, it makes, uh, it, it's a very specific starting point that we have, but it reaches a, a point of great relevance uh, to today. And we'll see these themes fleshed out in the, in the presentations and the discussion periods that we'll have after, um, afterwards. So for the discussion, of course, we'll be taking questions from here in the room. Uh, we'll also be taking questions on Twitter, hashtag CA100, and we'll be taking questions for those watching online on Adobe Live Connect. You can submit uh, questions through the Q&A function. We'll see those, and, um, and, and I'll read them out uh, as we moderate the discussion. So we're going to start with, um, with, with, uh, with three speakers, and we'll have the first discussion period after that. The first session we're calling Origins, and it's really looking at the history of the Canadian Arctic Expedition and Stephenson himself. So I, I want to turn to the first speaker. Uh, I'm so thrilled he's been able to join us today. This really is the, the person to talk to about the Canadian Arctic Expedition, uh, a Canadian scientist who uh, worked for many years uh, for the Canadian Museum of Nature, then eventually turned to history, has retraced some of Stephenson's steps in the Arctic, has curated major exhibitions for the uh, fe Canadian federal museums, is a filmmaker, uh, I, in, um, I think we're going to learn a lot from this, and so it's very much my pleasure at this moment to introduce our first speaker, Dr. David Gray. Thank you very much, Brian. Well, it's indeed a pleasure for me to be here today to share with you some of my enthusiasm for the Canadian Arctic Expedition. and. Uh, so often in history and, and studies like this, connections is the word that comes to mind the most. And I've already just in the last hour made some interesting connections with uh, other Stephenson, um, people interested in Stephenson and in the Arctic in general. So keep connections in mind as we all uh, make our pres presentations today. So as you know, that this, this year is the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the Canadian Arctic Expedition. And some of the things that are happening, um, the city of Ottawa, Canada's capital, all through the city, on the uh, around Parliament Hill, there are banners flying. And you can see the, the larger version over there on the wall. I just thought I would explain to you that banner because even in the city of Ottawa, the explanation of those two images is not really available. So on the left, we have an Inuk man from Bathurst <coughs> Inlet who was photographed by Dr. Anderson in 1916 wearing his own snow goggles to prevent snow blindness. His name was Anavik. And he was a hunter about which we know only two days of his life. The other image is of the ship Karlik, which was the flagship of the Canadian Arctic Expedition. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. In the celebration of this 100th anniversary, there's really not a lot happening. And I'm so delighted that here in North Dakota, we're celebrating this remarkable event. And we have not had a similar celebration in the capital city of Canada. So I'm just delighted that this is happening here. Oops. One of the other things that is happening is if you're a coin collector, you can buy a very expensive coin celebrating the Canadian Arctic Expedition. Um, but it's happening and it's making the expedition more known across Canada. But I would like to talk to you about the history of the expedition. So we're celebrating the history by learning more about it. Now this is not the symposium at which to discuss the saga of Icelandic migration in North America. From its medieval roots in Norway to the Norse connection with the eastern and western Greenland settlements, and the ill-fated efforts in the Vinland area that has recognized as Lanzo Meadows in northern Newfoundland. Nor is this the symposium the opportunity to look at the Icelanders of the early 19th century who emigrated into Mormon Desiree in America's inner montane west. Instead, 
Those start in the period of the 1860s and 1870s where Iceland has the origin. Pushes to leave at this time period were significant for these people. Unfortunately, the island was wrapped with economic upheaval in a sheep farming economy, pestilence and stock for land, and environmental conditions were characterized by volcanic eruptions which laid waste to what arable land was the basis for the perilous agrarian livelihood. Were there poles to stay? Family ties and familiarity with the cultural landscape were such poles, but the pushes outweighed these factors such to trigger the migration to Canada in the early 1870s. <coughs> Overcoming the obstacles of a perilous sea journey, there were multiple first destinations within Canada, each with their own respective poles and pushes for these immigrants. Limited settlement occurred in Quebec, Ontario, and Nova Scotia before the initial journey in 1875 to settle the Icelandic reserve of what was then in the Northwest Territories. Today, we would know this place as the area around Gimli, Manitoba. Eventually, the Icelanders established what is often called the Republican of Iceland, but the western shore of Lake Winnipeg was not their Gimli or heaven. It might have been for these people. Problems of flooding epidemics of contagious diseases so prevalent in the 19th century, and social discord became issues of concern such that these would become pushes for the Icelandic reserve in the next phase of Icelanders coming to what is now northeastern North Dakota. Good fishing in Lake Winnipeg and access to woodlands in the interlake, while poles for some were not enough for many people not to leave the Icelandic reserve and head for destinations such as Winnipeg, and for our tale today, Pembina County in Dakota Territory. What were the pools to come to the townships of Pembina County in the vicinity of Mount Garter? High quality land for wheat production and general farming, plus access to the Aspen Parkland for wood for certain. Yet seemingly as important was the opportunity for religious expression different from the main congregations of Lutheranism that then existed in the Icelandic Reserve. Pushes were limited for this part of the Pemina Escarpment other than initially limited access to new markets before the old Oxcart routes would be superseded by railways. Fortunately, between the 1880s and late 1910s, this area would have the rail net of branch lanes that connected it to the commercial center to the south and east which would help draw more immigrants to the region. Meanwhile, the key central place for this area would be outside Pembina County, in what was then a humble county courthouse town with a nearby small institution of higher education, respectively known as Grand Forks and the University of North Dakota. It was to this community, and particularly this college, that so strongly was supported by Icelanders from Pembina County, which the young Canadian, Wilhelmer Stephenson, arrived in 1898. So now the saga has a new chapter, which is presented by Mr. Mike Jacobs, publisher of the Grand Forks Herald. Thank you, Professor Munsky. You needn't stand. I'm going to take more than three and a half minutes. Uh, you, you may. Thank you. You need a good teacher. Wilmer Stefansson was born Canadian, uh, but he came to North Dakota when he was an infant in arms. He is a product of the Icelandic community of Mountain, North Dakota. It was a literate community. In his autobiography, Stephenson recalls reading evenings when his parents read to the family and sometimes to guests. Uh, the subjects generally were the Bible, the sagas, and one of the two newspapers printed in the Icelandic community in Pemina County. The Icelanders were a divided community. Uh, you might even say riven. The divisions were along religious lines with one segment adhering to a fairly rigid Christian theology and the other taking a somewhat broader view. Stephenson's family belonged to the later group. He grew up, he said, believing that the scriptures had approximately the same reliability as the Icelandic sagas. <laughs> His education was spotty. 
He did attend school in Mountain, at least intermittently, and he was perfectly fluent from childhood in Icelandic and English. He picked up enough German to be able to cheat in the class at UND when he got here. In any case, these antics led, in March of 1902, to a request to leave campus. This may have been an expulsion, as the university's history has it, or a suspension, as Stephenson reports in his autobiography. Stephenson himself says that he was delivered to the train station in a wheelbarrow, accompanied by an attractive female dressed as his widow. I want to thank um, everybody that really helped put this on, the Canadian consulate that was invited, uh, my friend Jim Shedd, and North Dakota University here. And uh, it's a real honor to be here. I mean, I couldn't believe if you're years back I'd be invited to something like this honoring Stephenson. Stephenson had actually a, a, a very big influence in my career. First of all, his anthropological studies and, and Anderson and all the other scientists, uh, those works uh, I read as a younger person. And, uh, it, was hard, it was hard to get, there was no internet back then, of course, and even some of these works are still hard to find. But I was always interested in the original works, especially uh, the study of the, of the original indigenous person, people, straight on, without interpretation, but as it really was. Uh, I also, when I first started out, uh, and uh, Stephenson's book, uh, The Friendly Arctic, had a real big influence on me. Uh, uh, I think I started Arctic exploration with the right attitude because of that. Uh, a lot of exploration and, and travel in the north are usually about conquering and going from point A to B and seeing how tough you can be along the way. Uh, but I really learned about the Arctic and uh, how to adapt to it, how to hunt, how to survive in it. In fact, the Arctic is like my backyard, I'm very comfortable in the Arctic. And the Arctic as opposed to uh, Antarctica, which is another totally different planet. I, I learned just how friendly the, our Arctic really is. Um, over my career in the last 50 years, uh, I've traveled uh, tens of thousands of miles by canoe, kayak, and dog sled. Um, I sledded through most of the Inuit communities in, in Canada and Alaska. Uh, many of the uh, northern Athabascans, uh, uh, the Dog Rib, the Cree, uh, all these communities I've been through over time. Uh, some of these communities I know three generations of peoples. And uh, I show up kind of with no rhyme or rhythm reason, all of a sudden I'll just appear in the middle of the night and meet old friends or their kids of old friends and, and so forth. So I've had um, a, a great career traveling uh, in the area. What I wanted to do first of all is to go through some pictures of an expedition that I took in 07. Um, myself, I, I um, represent the Will Steger Foundation out of my concern for the changing climate that I've observed in the polar areas and I've been across Antarctica been across actually all the great ice, ice caps of the Arctic Ocean, uh, which are incredibly changing in the last 15 years. So out of this concern, I formed the Will Steger Foundation, and we work in three areas, K-12 education and curriculum, and that would include also teacher enhancement, teacher training in this field. Uh, on the second area is, is our youth leadership, the high school, college, we network around the Midwest. Uh, we work with a number of students here in North Dakota, uh, leadership around taking taking action in the climate. The third area that we work in is, is climate policy. Uh, we wrote the climate policy, climate and energy policy for the state of Minnesota in December, January for Mark Dayton last year. So I've been working on policy most of my life for 25 years. Inuk satya tunga suki di kubia sukunga kai kai di kuya nami. Bon apéritif et merci tellement d'être venu aujourd'hui à notre conférence. Good afternoon, honored presenters and guests, and thank you so much for the honor of presenting here today. As we celebrate together the momentous occasion of the 100th anniversary of the Canadian Arctic Expedition, my talk today will hinge upon the philosophies of Stephenson, as discussed in one of his primary book manuscripts entitled The, Fan the Friendly Arctic, of which you may see the cover here. In the introduction to this text, the Honorable Sir Robert Laird Borden, the Prime Minister of Canada, under whom the expedition was carried out, and whose likeness is now seen on all $100 Canadian banknotes, wrote the following words from Ottawa in 1921. As a result of the expedition, 
Many thousands of square miles have been added to the territory of Canada. Much interesting material of great scientific value has been secured. Unknown areas of vast extent have been explored, and many illusions with respect to Arctic conditions have been dissipated. People thought, why should anyone want to explore the Arctic? The land up there is all covered with eternal ice. There is everlasting winter with intense cold. And the country, whether land or sea, is a lifeless waste of eternal silence. This was the current picture of the Arctic. And this is substantially what we have to unlearn before we can read in a true light any story of Arctic exploration. It was this focus of the idea of unlearning that was one of the wellsprings of Stephenson's ability to survive and thrive in the North. The Arctic is really central to our um, site here. As we think about ourselves, we, we, we think of ourselves as vast open spaces, really productive areas, the prairies, the, the the forests and lakes of um, eastern Canada, but then as you move north, you think about that whole world, that magical world of the Arctic, of, of glaciers, of snow, the, the, the sea ice, and it's very much part of who we are. We really value that. That's part of our um, border from sea, the west of the Pacific, to the Arctic, and then up to the Atlantic. It's really part of our um, community. And, and as you think about it, that Arctic is not a, a place that's static in time, it's not fixed a hundred years ago. It's a, it's a landscape and it's a, a geography that's changing very rapidly. And some of the fastest changes in the world because of climate change. And, and so as that changes, there's lots of forces happening with, with the environmental issues, leading to economic changes. And then as we see in the tin, with the growing interaction, the world is getting smaller, people are having opportunities to plug in, listen to different things. So we're looking at rapid changes around the world in the, 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 the society, the economic impacts and the environmental impacts of communities in, in the north. Canada really, um, well, uh, along with our other colleague countries, was really instrumental about uh, coming up to 20 years ago in 1996 in, in really putting together the concept of the Arctic Council about really bringing countries who are part of the Arctic, and just if you think of those countries, they're of course Canada, uh, um, Denmark, which includes uh, um, Greenland, um, Finland, Norway, Ru um, Russia, Sweden, the United States, of course, with Alaska, and then last but not least, um, Iceland. So th those countries really get, got together and realized that what we need to do is collectively look at those issues, how we work together on them. There's also a realization that that very often the capitals of those countries, you know, um, you think of Ottawa, you think of Washington, uh, you think of Moscow, they're thousands of miles away from the, um, the Arctic. They're very removed in terms of geography and very removed in terms of headspace, if you like, from those areas. So the real realization that this cannot just be governments talking to governments. This has to really involve the local people, the people of the North, as part of that decision making. And because the um, Arctic brings all those nations together that, that no one view is dominant. This has to be a, a, a place where people work together to work together to develop consensus-based consensus decisions for the future. There's also another dilemma here with energy, uh, speaking for Alaska, uh, the cost of diesel fuel, running generators, heating and so forth, uh, some villages are actually folding up. And uh, a lot of the people are moving to Fairbanks, uh, uh, Anchorage and so forth. Uh, also, there's a, another dilemma here in, uh, in northern Ontario with the warmer winters because they rely on the ice roads uh, to bring in fuel. And uh, it's a right expense. We get a cold winter and we get a warm winter. And uh, so, in years where you don't have an ice road, it's extremely costly to buy in fuel, pushing in small communities. And the question there then. Cost. to keep a small community going. It's a real dilemma because um, we've gone way out the limb and relying on fossil fuel energy, especially in the north. And when the cost goes up or you can't pay it in. Uh, it's, it's a different problem. And uh, it's, it's the uh, northern Nethabaskan, the northern Indian people, uh, of course, that would trapping, but there the fur market went out, and uh, that really devastated the culture there. The fur, fur prices are up a little bit, but not enough. <coughs> uh, people there that used to be able to easily make a living by trapping and uh, subsistence hunting, living in log cabins, eating the wood, pretty much off, you know, totally self-sufficient, and that, that, that's changed now too. So 
this is a, a real, real dilemma uh, that we're starting to see. Um, some opportunities here, especially in the new communities, for wind. I know Blue uh, and some other communities in the far north tried wind in the 70s, but uh, there's incredible stories about these wind turbines that just disintegrated in high, high wind. This back in the 70s, you had the high RPM uh, wind turbines, but the uh, the slower RPM ones are very, uh, very efficient. And I uh, you know on, on the western coast of Alaska, whole bay in that area, uh, wind, is, wind is coming back. So there is a need now to get more energy self-sufficient. Uh, this, this is a transition too. It's not going to happen in the night. But, uh, but it's a serious problem that we have to face. We have to take a look at what, what we do in the future to uh, get these communities more self-sufficient. Mr. Gorenson, did you want to speak from your perspective as a member of the government of Manitoba? Sure. Actually, feel free if you want to stand up, you'll be more in the camera shot. Oh. People online can actually see you. You can look at that camera down there. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll sit down. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank everybody who spoke today. Uh, yeah. This is a very, very important discussion to have. Uh, certainly, uh, when you look at Canada's north, if you consider the geography of that area alone and the population, I believe that the geography would make it uh, in itself, I think, the seventh largest country in the world. That's something Canada has a lot of, a lot of geography, <laughs> uh, but not a lot of people. And uh, that's multiplied when you see that in the north. But the north is incredibly important to Canada. And uh, in my previous role as a minister responsible for international trade, we were looking at the Northern Corridor uh, using the Port of Churchill as a deep sea port, which unfortunately due to global warming is becoming more accessible for long-term shipping. Um, but I'm encouraged by the conversation that we've had today. I'm really uh, pleased that our uh, academics, our researchers uh, are such champions of the North and uh, looking to give voice to the North. I'm glad that they are involved in the Arctic Council uh, with Indigenous communities as part of those discussions. I had the privilege of hearing a presentation from the Council General from Iceland uh, seven weeks ago on the same topic. One of the concerns that I have uh, when you talk about safe shipping is the fact that we can only do this once and get it right. And uh, in what we've seen uh, the tragedy in Latin Atlantic. Uh, and of course, we just go back a few years with the Exxon Valdez and the impact that that had in Alaska. Um, there are talks to bring crude oil to Churchill. And, um, you know, that's uh, very disconcerting, quite frankly, because uh, Churchill, as a port, was primarily for the transportation of grain, about 5%. Canada's grain went through the port of Churchill at one time. It's a little different if cars carrying uh, grain derail than cars carrying crude oil. So in the mandate of the Arctic Council, does it go beyond shipping and is it going to look at all the intermodal forms of transportation and the products and goods that are being proposed to come through our ports in northern Canada? That's a pretty loaded question, but it's, it's certainly one that's near and dear uh, to uh, my colleague, Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation in Manitoba, who came out very strongly opposed to that happening through the Port of Churchill. I mean, I, again, I think it's, um, I think for the um, Arctic Council, it really is that whole notion of sustainable resource development, sustainable solar communities. So it's really part of that, and I think Canada, it, that is a really critical question, man, in Canada, domestically have to put as well, all of those kinds of uh, group of regulations to uh, avoid those kinds of mistakes. So you're actually right in essentially moving to track of uh, environments like the Arctic. So the targets for those kinds of uh, areas is just about zero in terms of that and the environment. Sure, okay, we'll take uh, just a question from the floor from the past the mic over there. Actually, not a question, but a uh, kind of a response. Um, in conjunction with the Arctic Council, there, there have been two international agreements signed, one for search and rescue 
and one for an environmental disaster, uh, how the different countries will respond in, in case of each. And there have been, at least for search and rescue, the U.S. and Russians have uh, had an exercise this summer, and, and I believe that the U.S. and Canada have done that. I know Canada and, uh, and Denmark have done that up, up in Greenland. That's the good news. The bad news is there's not any resources in the Arctic, or very few resources in the Arctic, to address uh, an oil spill, especially if it's maritime.